Denver's plan to fight homelessness by paying for hotel rooms has led to a lot of vacancy signs. Why are the rooms going unused after we pay for them? Deadline day for city employees to get vaccinated or exempted. And despite what you've heard, the vast majority just did it. If vaccine mandates do cause some staff shortages, hospitals are one place where you can't scrimp and bringing in outsiders is expensive. We did not intend to devote two days to this story, but you have too many unanswered questions about the plan to drench the top of Mount Evans in mountain lion pee to scare away the goats. So we'll return to Colorado's number one 14 -er. next. There are hotel rooms paid for and reserved in Denver for people experiencing homelessness. And at last check, more than half were empty. It's because people have to meet pandemic related criteria to use the rooms. Our Marshall Zellinger looks into this program that the city is hoping to continue after the pandemic. I know what the sign says, but this building at Spear and Zunai is not a hotel. Like this one near I-70 in Quebec and this one downtown. I'm not trying to mess with you. These hotels are rented out by the city of Denver and the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless as pandemic shelters for people experiencing homelessness. FEMA only allows us to offer non-congregate shelter to people with certain qualifying conditions. Because federal FEMA funds are paying for the 646 hotel rooms currently reserved, the residents have to fit one of the following criteria be older than 65, have a health condition that puts them at great risk of COVID, or sick with COVID. One of the facilities is activated respite is what we call it. It's for someone who's symptomatic or positive for COVID to get better. And we're really fortunate that you know, that facility is not highly utilized. That means there are vacant rooms. The city is paying for hotel rooms that may sit empty. Every day we're going to have vacancies in these um, motels. When we're able to move people out, their room becomes vacant and it may take us some time to turn that room over and, and make it appropriate for another person to come in. Take the Aloft Hotel downtown, for example. The city rents the whole building, 140 rooms, 98 are full, 42 are vacant. One of the reasons for that, it was going to close today when FEMA money ran out. Well, FEMA extended the program and city council recently approved 11 million more dollars that will be reimbursed by FEMA to keep these types of shelters going. Now we're having to rehire staff and reevaluate folks for being able to get into those rooms. At the hotel shelter near I-70 in Quebec, there is Sand Creek and someone camping along Sand Creek, just feet from where they could be living inside. We do move a lot of people from encampments into the motel rooms, um, but again, they still have to meet the, the criteria of being at high risk. Being somewhat of the investigative thinker I am, I asked if these businesses leasing out their hotels are getting a sweet deal than you know, if, if the city just paid by the room. And the stories I'm told is this was during a pandemic when yeah. they had no business. And sure, they, they met as a partner with the city and with the Colorado Coalition said, you need rooms, we've got empty rooms, here you go. And now maybe they're missing out on revenue because if they opened up as a regular hotel, they could be getting more mm -hmm. than perhaps the city is paying. So you also hear the city of Denver talking about the idea of hotels and motels converted permanently into housing for people experiencing homelessness, not necessarily the aloft downtown, but other spaces post pandemic. Regardless of COVID, and it's going to be a ballot issue that we're going to talk about later on when everybody gets their ballot, it's 2B, it's one of the bond issues. Mm -hmm. So the, the city would borrow money paid back with taxpayer money, and it would start buying, if people approve this, you could buy more motels and hotels, convert them to uh, areas where people experiencing homelessness could live inside. Would not necessarily have the same issues with the lack of occupancy because it wouldn't have the same COVID restrictions. Right, you wouldn't, have to, you wouldn't have to abide yeah. by the FEMA rules. Yeah. All right. Well, we want people to have a safe and warm place to stay because as you prove, it's sweater weather. Today's the last day for every Denver City employee to upload proof of their vaccination or approval of a vaccine exemption request. And the city says 98% of its full-time workforce is good to go. Sheriff's Department has one of the highest rates of unvaccinated or unapproved employees, but they are still over 90% vaccinated or exempted as of this afternoon, about 6% outstanding in the Sheriff's Department. Denver Police are 97.4% vaccinated or exempted. Denver Fire, 99.4% good. Denver Human Services, 98.6%. Come October 1, um, each agency will receive a list of non-compliant employees and through work with our office, uh, they, will be, they will be issuing contemplation of discipline letters and setting hearings during which an employee will have an opportunity to be heard uh, and then we will move forward with our progressive discipline process. 
So discipline process means uh, it's 10 day unpaid suspension where the employee is supposed to go get vaccinated or get an approved exemption or the other option uh, is the door. Uh, they can just leave their job with the city. Denver Public Schools employees have until midnight to submit their vaccine or exemption documentation. And as of this afternoon, the district reported 88% compliance. Tonight's next question comes from Steve in Milliken about benefits for employees fired when they refuse to get vaccinated or show an exemption. Here's my question. If an employer mandates COVID-19 vaccinations and an employee refuses and is then fired, are they eligible for unemployment benefits? Steve, that is a great question. The answer is complicated, but you all can handle complicated information. So State Department of Labor and Employment tells us that employees who are let go or who quit for not following a company's vaccine mandate can certainly file for unemployment. Doesn't mean that they'll get approved. Each claim is reviewed independently. Here are the criteria. State pointed out to us that unemployment benefits are met for Coloradans who lose work through no fault of their own. If an employee is fired for not following a company policy, they'll look at the details of that. State said if being vaccinated against COVID is relevant to the job, then the employee would not likely qualify for unemployment benefits. It's a great question. We're going to keep following this issue. Keep the questions coming. Email, audio, or video to next at 9news.com because if you're wondering, someone else is too. Hospitals across our state are coming up with contingency plans to figure out what to do if they lose some staffing because of vaccine mandates. Traveling health care workers could help fill the gap, but they are in high demand, i.e. expensive. Anusha Roy digs into this complicated situation. When COVID struck, the folks at Lincoln Health in Hugo found themselves relying more on traveling health care workers in their long-term care facilities. They decided they resigned their positions, either because it was, it was really hard during COVID. I think it was hard mentally on our staff. It was hard mentally, you know, and physically. The work is hard. Then rates for traveling certified nursing aides doubled in less than a year, from $32 to $39 an hour in January to 80 bucks an hour now. How long can you guys last, you know, paying at this higher rate to bring people in? I think the reality is we can't. So as they work on getting creative with staffing, like how to best utilize nurses. I'm worried about the loss of nurses to our workforce. I, I really, every day. It's one of those things that wakes me up at night. Concern over staffing is very real. Part of it is vaccine mandates, according to the Colorado Hospital Association. We have heard from some of our hospitals that some of their staff will leave because of the vaccine mandate. Um, it could be happening even later this week. Um, and, and some hospitals may choose to terminate employees. But also because this last year was really hard and healthcare workers are burning out. Traveling staff have to follow the same vaccine requirements or have an exemption in Colorado. Costs are going up because there's a shortage of people, a lot of demand, and an ask for hazard pay because of COVID risk. But if traveling staff is part of the solution, the question is, is it even affordable at this point? Well beyond what they would normally pay and, and may even be able to afford even in these extreme times. And who is it hurting the most? I'm worried across the board, but if, I, if you really ask me where it's critical, it is in rural. Yeah, that's because you're dealing with really different budgets and staffing levels. When you're looking at some of our smaller hospitals, there's not a lot of wiggle room for them. There are also a lot of people now looking to the state for some help who actually reactivated their staffing fusion center. So that's basically the step state stepping in to fill staffing shortages. They said it's not directly tied to the vaccine requirements, but to help with the stopgap staffing and then said federal funding is helping out to pay for that as well, Kyle. And the state of Nusha is about to start collecting some detailed information to figure out what they're up against here. Yeah, because a lot of people want to know, you know, what are the vaccine rates in our hospitals? And today was kind of asking one hospital at a time. But starting tomorrow, these hospitals are going to be reporting not only vaccine rates, not only exemption rates, but twice a month, they're also going to be reporting what their staffing levels are looking at just to keep track of how many people are still working, how many people ultimately did leave their jobs. Next viewers are going to be missing you here in the coming weeks because at the end of this week, Anusha, you are about to start your maternity leave. I have said here before that one of the things I admire most about you and your work is that you're always seeking out the uh, the challenging and the complex it issues because you know that, that those are the most important. Well, whoo, wait till you get oh. a taste of parenthood. You're oh going to love it.
Yeah, no, I'm just on standby right now for my entire life to be completely changed. So, yeah, this will be the biggest challenge, but I can't wait. And, yeah, I'll be gone for a couple of months just kind of settling into motherhood best that I can. I hope you love every minute of it. You won't, but I hope that you do. <laughs> and I can't wait. It'll be great. All right, thank you, Nusha. A final thought as we hit the vaccine or exemption deadline for some employers across Colorado. While the attention, including for many of us in the media, has been on, on the holdouts, the protesters, the lawsuit bringers, the you won't make me crowd, it's undeniable by the numbers. The vast majority of the Coloradans affected by these rules are choosing to get vaccinated. These nudges and incentives and sometimes mandates to get the vaccine or get a valid exemption, they're clearly serving their purpose to encourage hesitant Coloradans to go protect themselves and those around them. Now, it's undeniably smart strategy for anti-vaxxers to be really vocal about their opposition because it makes them appear more numerous than they actually are. The polling nationwide has showed all along that there is a slice of the population willing to get the shot if that's what was necessary to keep a job that they like or to do something that they enjoy doing. The results suggest that even more people were persuadable than we thought. A relatively puny punishment after an absolutely horrific worksite death in Colorado. Our state's leaders ask for a pause in a move that former President Trump admitted was political favoritism and punishment for Colorado. Goodbye to an old timer. Ever since I can remember, there's always been Miner's Tavern. Actual miners used to tip them back there. Not many miners around town anymore. That's next. OSHA says that a dairy farm in northern Colorado failed to do enough to protect its employees and to train them on hazards in the workplace. It just cited Shelton Land and Cattle Limited for the death of a worker we told you about earlier. Juan Ponzo Tomoxle died a gruesome death back in May. Tomoxle, a 44-year-old father of three, was offloading manure into a pit at the dairy in Greeley when his truck went in. It trapped him in the submerged cab. He died the following day at the hospital. He left a family in Mexico that was counting on his financial support. He had only worked at that farm for six weeks. OSHA says that if Shelton Land and Cattle had installed the required guardrails, he'd still be alive. His death is not going to cost the farm much financially, just more than $24,000 in penalties. Colorado just strengthened some state laws aimed at protecting farm workers, gives those employees the right to organize and join labor unions, and removed the exemption of agricultural labor from state and local minimum wage laws. Coloradans in Congress are trying to hold on to the Space Force command here by saying that moving it to Alabama could endanger national security. Democratic Senator Michael Bennett, Republican Congressman Doug Lamborn are among those signed on to a letter now asking the Air Force Secretary to keep Space Force command in the spring. They also want an investigation of President Trump's admission that it was political favoritism that led him to order the base move to Alabama. The Colorado delegation is arguing now that that move would undermine the U.S.'s ability to respond to threats in space and would disrupt current missions. Cloudy and chilly today definitely felt like fall with those easterly winds pushing that cloud deck across Denver. We managed upper 50s, some 60s in eastern Colorado, and a bit more of the rain and snow coming into the southern half of the state. There's a center of circulation to our south. I don't think this moisture is going to make it into Denver. I'm going to keep us dry tonight and tomorrow, and too much rain on the I-70 corridor with a flash flood watch extended out through 9 o'clock tonight. We'll continue to see rain and snow in southern Colorado. The clouds give way to some clearing and Denver tonight. Partly cloudy tomorrow. I think Denver stays dry on your Friday. Tonight, our low at 43. So a chilly night. Tomorrow's high closer to 70. That's more like it. Beautiful weekend. And then a string of warm days. Sunshine, 75 to 80 for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Enjoy. It's just always been there, and it's just like the dive bar of Erie. A town no longer small loses its watering hole. And speaking of the need to relieve yourself, so many questions about last night's report on spraying mountain lion pee on Mount Evans to scare away the goats. Our commitment to investigative journalism gets you answers. Next. We've talked about restaurants having staffing issues lately, and it's why the University of Northern Colorado is going to close one of its two dining halls. 
Tobel Kendi ser Kendall serves about 375 meals a day to students, mostly freshmen. And UNC Dining Service is so understaffed, they figure they can't keep both their food halls open. They're down 50 student employees, and they have 16 full-time vacancies. So the remaining staff are all going to consolidate at the Holmes Dining Hall to handle the increased traffic there. Angry students have started a petition in true college student fashion, and they're demanding the student government get more say in what goes on at that one remaining dining hall at UNC. There's a bar in Erie that served minors for years, and it was never a problem. M-I-N-E-R-S. But there aren't many minors left in a town that used to have working coal mines and working coal miners thirsty after their shifts. Miners Tavern opened in downtown Erie in 1926. The owner announced that they are going to shut things down on Saturday. In large part due to financial issues caused by the pandemic, they say, and partly also, guess what? Yep, yeah, it's staffing. So they're going to sling the remaining beer and burgers over the next few days and allow people to come by and say goodbye. It's, it's going to be a it, huge it's loss. It's going to take its toll. I mean, they're, there's, uh, they're starting to open more restaurants, but not, as, not one that's got the history of this. But it's sad to kind of feel like there's nothing really you can do, but it's like obviously unfortunate. And I really think that the community, at least Old Town itself, is going to miss it for sure. A sign outside that tavern says there is a chance that they could return if the financial situation changes. So if you are like us, as in immature, all you could think about after last night's program was the story about mountain lion urine. And it left one large unresolved question. What if spraying mountain lion urine on the Mount Evans tourist area doesn't just scare away the goats and sheep, but also brings in mountain lions? If you're unfamiliar with the story, there are researchers from the Denver Zoo trying to figure out how to keep mountain goats and bighorn sheep off the tourist area at the top of Mount Evans. They're worried about bad interactions between humans and animals. So what they've decided to do is spray the area with some mountain lion urine that they bought on the internet. We followed up with the researchers today to see if they were at all concerned that they would attract more big cats to the area. They told us that they do not believe that the mountain lions would approach, approach crowds of people, which is good. Uh, but they're not certain if the mountain lions are attracted to the scent of each other's urine. They think if the lions did show up looking for love, they would come at night. If that happened, they say they'd stop spraying urine up there because the last thing that they want to do is attract the mountain lions to where the humans and the goats are. Also, uh, we have a slight correction from yesterday's story. Uh, the zoo's researcher misspoke when he said that they purchased the mountain lion urine on Amazon. My apologies to anyone who went there looking for it. They said they actually got it on a website called thepmart.com. How this show remains on the air is astonishing to all of us, but we will finish with your feedback next. Back and forth feedback tonight on the idea of the vaccine mandates in the workplaces. Chrisana Barrett writing in say this is straight up scary. People should not have their bodies controlled to keep their jobs. Elaine Farrell echoes what we hear from the other side of the fence saying follow the rules or work elsewhere. Can't help but wonder if maybe some of this is going to sort workplaces into different groups of people who just view health and safety differently. I don't know if that's the worst idea in the world. We'll see you next time.